password managers have vulnerabilities, companies want us to just chill out over their embedded recording devices and hardware, and WinRAR has a 19-year-old bug. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris, and this is ThreatWire for February 26, 2019, your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. Last month, thanks to our patrons, I started rendering the video RSS file at a much smaller file size to help with data caps. It's still at 1080p format, so if you see any kind of compatibility issues, let me know. The link for that video RSS is down in the video description right here on YouTube. And real quick, I would like to give a special shout out to my newest Patreon supporters this week, including Vince, Anthony, Tony, Hamir, Tortuga, Jamie, Victoria, Bob, Patrick, Wes, Jason, and Scott. And by the way, for every new patron that signs up for the month of February, I will be donating $5 to WISP, which is the Women in Security and Privacy Initiative. So you unlock perks, we both help a good cause. If you're interested in supporting ThreatWire, hit up patreon.com slash ThreatWire. And this is the last week that I'll be doing that WISP support. So definitely support if you want to. Now on to the news. We love password managers here, and by the end of the story, you will understand why I still recommend them. In a study published by the Independent Security Evaluators, or ISE for short, on February 19th, researchers found several vulnerabilities in the software versions of password managers for Windows 10. This included 1Password 7, 1Password 4, Dashlane, KeePass, and LastPass. The researchers found that all five of the applications could allow an attacker to see the master password sometimes in plain text, through the memory on a Windows 10 PC, even when the password manager software was locked. The finding puts 60 million users at risk of stolen credentials. ISE states that password use has increased over time from 25 password per user in 2007 to a projected growth of 207 passwords per user in 2020. So they were quite motivated to do this study. They tested the managers in three different states, not running where it's pre previously installed but it's not currently operating, running unlocked where it's running and the user has unlocked the password manager and has access to their vault of passwords, and then running locked where the password manager has been launched on the machine but it has not been unlocked with the master password. They built in security guarantees for each of these states that a user could expect. For example, when the manager is locked, it shouldn't be possible to extract the master password from memory. Now, when testing 1Password 4, ISE discovered that when the software goes from unlocked to locked, the master password fails to be scrubbed from the memory on the machine, and in some occasions, it could be left in memory in plain text. Unencrypted passwords were cleared from that memory state whenever new entry was accessed. When moving from unlocked to lock on 1Password 7, ISE found that individual passwords, the master password, and secret keys for encryption were not scrubbed from the memory correctly. A user would need to exit the software completely to clear the data from memory, not just lock it. And when asked about this issue, Chief Officer at 1Password Jeffrey Goldberg stated that fixing this problem would introduce larger security risks, and that 1Password stands by their decision to leave that issue intact, as the threat vector is extremely limited since an attacker would need access to an already compromised computer to be able to access this issue as well. Now with Dashlane, a similar problem occurred. Whenever entries were updated, the entire database was exposed in memory after the software is logged out. In an article by ZDNet, a spokesperson stated specifically the same info as Goldberg, that the scenario would be very limited and an attacker would have to have already compromised the computer to be able to access that information. KeePass acknowledged the same issue with memory in Windows operating systems and even includes this information in their security guidelines on their website. While KeePass does scrub the master password, some credentials would be recoverable if they were interacted with. Now lastly, LastPass credentials that were interacted with would also be contained in memory after the software is locked, and the master password could be obtained through a memory leak. LastPass CTO Sandor Palfi stated that an attacker would need local admin access to the device to use this memory leak for their advantage. LastPass did release a patch though for their LastPass for application software download, which is where the vulnerability persisted. Now if the password managers for any of the above were 
not in a running state, then the vulnerability does not persist at all. ISC also found that RoboForm did not have this issue, but had their own problem where a master password was left in some function calls, but this problem has since been addressed as well. Now, in all cases, this would require a user to be using a software download application on their machine, not simply the in-browser extension or mobile apps. So if I'm reading the research correctly, this does not appear to affect anything but the desktop applications. Now, the author of this story, his name is Adrian Bednarek, has since been kicked off a of bug crowd, which is a crowdsourced vulnerability reporting platform and security company, for reportedly violating the company's rules on unauthorized disclosure of the research to a reporter. He reported the problem on bug crowd on January 19th, was told it was a duplicate, they'd already seen the vulnerability, was banned from bug crowd on February 12th, then published the research on ISE on February 19th. Bednarek was hoping to be reinstated to bug crowd as of time of recording. Now, why do I still recommend using a password manager? Password reuse, common passwords, weak passwords, generic ones, those can all lead a human to be considered low-hanging fruit when an attacker is looking for a foothold into a system or network. Using a password manager adds an extra layer of security to your online life by removing that problem of passwords since you can simply, simply store them all and create hard ones instead. Password managers can also create randomly generated passwords that are much harder to reverse engineer than human memorized ones, and while not necessarily advertised, that's one of my favorite parts of using them. And a good password manager will have the option to turn on two-factor authentication, which will add another layer to security in case you are worried about that master password actually being stolen. And from a, I don't care about security, I just want a convenience standpoint, password managers do make it a lot easier and faster to log into sites. You don't have to sit there stressing out and resetting your passwords because you forgot one since each and every single one is stored and ready for you. It's also faster to click an autofill button than it is to type in my credentials every time. So yeah, I am pro password managers. What rights do you have as consumers when it comes to potential threat vectors that aren't in use? Well, it turns out that companies just don't want us to worry about it. Back on the 16th of February, a Twitter user named VCamLuck, that's their Twitter username, noticed an eerie looking sensor on the back of their seat on a Singapore Airlines flight. Singapore Airlines replied to this tweet swiftly, saying that yes, it was a camera embedded in the hardware on their newer in-flight entertainment systems, but they are disabled and the airline had no plans to develop any features using those cameras. They also noted that these cameras are found in business, premium economy, and economy fare seats. Now, while Singapore Airlines denies that these are used, another airliner was also bombarded with questions regarding the entertainment system cameras. American Airlines also has cameras embedded in those entertainment systems, and American also stated that they would not be using them and they are not activated. Now, these could be used logically for things such as in-flight video calling or photo sharing in our social media age, or maliciously, they could be used to track our gaze as we watch certain entertainment or advertisements on the screen. They could be used to track data about rest and eating habits and sleep and your bathroom breaks away from your seat. And since in-flight entertainment systems have already been found to be easily hackable, the link is in the show notes, going back to 2016, it is cause for concern that cameras are embedded in these devices. It's entirely plausible that while they aren't in use by the airliner, an attacker could in theory try to gain access to them. Now alongside this news is Google's Nest, which had a hidden microphone built in, surprising many customers who were never informed. Called the Nest Guard, that's Google's Nest Secure Hub, it does indeed have a microphone, even though it has never been listed in the tech specs for consumers. Google announced on February 4th that voice assistance would be coming to the device, which was followed by questions about the microphone. Again, the company explained that this microphone has never been activated, and their omission of the hardware was a mistake on their part. Now we know that this microphone will be used for voice assistance, but it could also be used to detect glass breaks 
breaking, et cetera, et cetera. Now with so many companies building recording devices into their hardware for future uses, or as the airliner state, just buying them off the shelf with the cameras already built in, should we be concerned that they aren't disclosing this information to customers? Do they put too much faith in products never being activated, assuming that if they aren't activated, they couldn't be breached? I would love to know your comments on this, so definitely let me know if you're watching on YouTube in the show notes and comments below. Checkpoint Research posted a report on the 20th about a very serious vulnerability in WinRAR that has been around for 19 years. Yes, you heard that right. I said 19. WinRAR has been used for file compression on Windows computers by 500 million users worldwide. And this problem affects any version of WinRAR downloaded in the past 19 years. Now the problem was fixed last month with version 5.70 beta 1 before Checkpoint made it public. The CVE for this flaw is 2018 20250 through 20253. It resides in a third party library, which is called unacev2.dll, and it couldn't allow for a system to get hijacked by tricking a user into basically just opening a malicious archive. That's it. The library is included in all versions of WinRAR, and it's used for handling the extraction of files compressed in a very specific file format, which is called .ace. The researchers could use this library to create malicious ACE archives, which when unzipped or decompressed, could plant malicious files outside of that destination folder. They gave an example of planting a malicious file in the startup folder, which would execute upon rebooting the computer, thereby owning the machine. The researchers found the vulnerability, which is called a path traversal attack, in that library. This would allow them to view and access directories that should not have been intended for the user to access. Now, the library was originally compiled way back in 2005, and they had no protections, so it was easy for them to manipulate by renaming the ACE to a RAR, which could be opened by WinRAR and used to attack the machine. Now, because of this, WinRAR dropped their support for the ACE file format altogether in that beta release. Now, home users should be wary of opening any .ace archives and ensure that they have updated to the newest version of WinRAR. I would like to end this show with a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. If you are interested in getting access to a slew of extras and perks, even if it's just one or two bucks a month, hit that button to become a Patreon supporter because it all helps. And it shows me that you appreciate the work that I am putting in for this show each and every week. Also a big thanks to our Hush Puppy Perk Level patrons for sending in their fur baby photos. We got a weird one this week. I love them. Keep them coming. I am a Pokemon fan, so I'm okay with this. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And with that, I'm Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet.